Greetings. My name is Terry Covey and I'm the pastor of Twin Oaks Baptist Church. This message that you are about to hear was delivered at Twin Oaks. We pray that it will be a blessing to you and if there are any questions that you may have or any way that we may be of help to you, please feel free to contact us. God bless you and have a great day. All right, take your Bibles. First of all, turn to Romans, the book of Romans. to introduce the message today out of the book of Romans. Romans chapter 1. There's, we're going to kind of just do a quick little survey, of two or three verses in the book of Romans, and then we'll get to Matthew here in just a little bit. Talk with you today about peace. Jesus said, blessed are those who work to bring peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. Romans chapter 1, verse 7, Paul, as he introduces his letter to the Romans, and he says, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now go to chapter 14. Romans chapter 14, verse 17. That's a good sound in all those pages turning. In church, Romans chapter 14, verse 17. Paul says, For the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, or in other words, temporal, earthly things, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Chapter 15, verse 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Verse 33. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. The Bible teaches us that God is the God of peace. Over and over again, at least five times in in the Bible, the Bible says that God is the God of peace. We know that God is holy, that He is righteous, that He's all-powerful, that He's all-knowing. We know all of those great marvelous attributes of God But the Bible also says that a part of the divine nature of God is that God is a God of peace. God created this world in peace. Heaven will be a place of peace. One day when Jesus comes back and sets up his millennial kingdom, the 1,000 year reign of Christ, when Satan will be bound for that 1,000 years and when sin will be subdued, The Bible says that the world will once again be a place of peace. It says in the book of Isaiah, Then wolves will live in peace with lambs. Leopards will lie down to rest with goats. Calves, lions, and young bulls will eat together. And a little child will lead them. The Bible says that Jesus, one of his titles is, He is the Prince of Peace. The Bible also teaches us that peace is a part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So we understand very clearly from Scripture that God is a God of peace and that God wants peace. Yet there isn't peace. It says in the book of Jeremiah, there was a time when people said, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Why is there no peace? Why is it when we went through a decade or so of hippies who marched and talked about peace and we had peace symbols and everything was about peace. Why is it when we formed the United Nations to bring the nations of the world together in order to establish peace, why is it after billions of years of supposedly of evolution we have not been able to come to a point of being peaceful? Why is there no peace? There's as much unrest today as there's ever been. So why is that? Well, it says in the book of Isaiah, There is no peace, peace saith my God, to the wicked. Sin destroys peace. Whenever sin enters into whatever it is, whenever sin enters into a home, sin destroys peace. Whenever sin enters into a church, sin destroys peace. Whenever sin enters into the world, sin destroys peace. There was a time when there was peace in heaven until an angel by the name of Lucifer decided that he no longer wanted to follow what God wanted. He wanted his own way. He believed that what he wanted was greater than what anybody else might want. The Bible says he disrupted the peace that is in heaven. And even to this very day, in a sense, there is not really the peace in heaven that there was before Satan did this. Even to this day, you read the book of Job, apparently Satan still has access 
to God, Satan is still able to travel back and forth from heaven to earth and he has conversations with God. And even right now, probably even this very day, this, that there will be somewhat of an antagonism. There will be somewhat of a conflict between God and, and Lucifer, Satan, even this day. Even the peace of heaven has been disrupted. There will be no peace until Jesus Christ rules and reigns. There will be no peace on earth. There will really be no peace in home. There will be no peace in marriages. There will be no peace in trying to raise children. There will be no peace at workplaces. There will be no peace in nations. There will be no peace in an individual's life until Jesus Christ rules and reigns. Sin destroys peace. Sin has tried to enter into every facet. When Satan first, after he fell there from heaven, after he disrupted the peace that is in heaven, he came to earth, he deceived Adam and Eve, he deceived Eve into eating the fruit. And then she, the Bible says Adam was with her and he gave, she gave to him the fruit and they ate. And yesterday I was doing some premarital counseling for a couple that will get married next month. And we were talking about, you know, the first session I always cover with them about God's foundation, Genesis 1 and 2 and primarily chapter 2, God's foundation, what a home is supposed to be like. And then the second session, we always cover Genesis chapter 3, which talks about how that Eve was deceived. She ate of the fruit. She gave to Adam. He ate of the fruit. And immediately after they ate of the fruit, there was a disruption of the peace between them and God. When God came in the cool of the day to talk with them, they hid themselves. There was a division. There was a disruption of the peace between them and God. Then when God asked Adam, why is it that you've done this? Why is it that you've eaten of this fruit? What did Adam say? The woman you gave me. He attacked his wife. Suddenly there was a division between in the home. Then God told Eve, he says, you will, from this point on, you will want to try to dominate your husband and there will be this rivalry between you. There will be a disruption of peace. You go to the next chapter, chapter 4, and you find Cain killing Abel. You go a couple of more chapters and it says, the time of Noah that God looked down upon the earth and he saw that every imagination of man's heart was on evil continuously. Sin, sin disrupts peace. And whenever, listen carefully, whenever there is a disruption of peace, Sin is the culprit. Whenever there's a disruption in the home, whenever there's a disruption in the workplace, whenever there's a disruption between parents and children, even the Bible says when there's a disruption in the church, sin is there. Sin is the instigator of it. Sin causes this. You know, in the early church there was a great rivalry. Well, not a rivalry, but there was a disruption of peace. Some people believe that you can only eat certain things, and other people believe that, well, you can eat anything. And the Bible says there was, can you believe that? There was a division in the church over what you can eat. We have some good friends that uh, they were in a church one time, and they heard a pastor preach a message called the issue of the tissue. The church was divided over the color of the toilet tissue. You say, oh, I never, listen, very few churches have ever split over biblical heresy. Most churches have split over personal preferences and opinions. Somebody says, I want to dominate. I want what I want. So really the message, the issue of the tissue, you laugh at that, but that's a very real message because we're, by nature, sin makes us selfish. That's what caused Lucifer to rebel against God. He said, I, Isaiah chapter 14, I want, I will, I will be. I, me, it's all about me. And whenever we get focused upon ourselves, that disrupts the peace. Sin produces selfishness, and that selfishness disrupts the peace. But not only is there dis disruption of peace in heaven and in, on earth and in families and sometimes even in churches, the primary disruption of peace is between God and man. Jesus said this, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Now, God is a kind and a loving and a merciful and a gracious God. But the Bible also teaches us that God is holy, that he's pure, that heaven is an absolute perfect and pure place. And when sin entered into mankind, the Bible says it caused, the word that the Bible uses is enmity. It caused a division between God and man. It made us enemies to God, and in many ways, God enemies to us as well. Man is an enemy to God because man opposes God's holiness. 
Jesus said this, This then is the judgment that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who practices wicked things hates the light and avoids it so that his deeds may not be exposed. Why is it that there's some people just you talk with them about coming to church and that's the last place they want to come? Why is it sometimes that even if there's people maybe will profess the name of Jesus Christ but they don't want to go to church? Why is that? Well, Jesus says it's a matter of sin. He calls, he used darkness there to illustrate sin. And he says people who want to be in darkness People who want to live in darkness, they don't want the light turned on. The light is offensive to them. You know that. You've experienced that. I think about that. I think about some friends of ours in, in Ohio. And you had to know Dave Reed. He was just always so comical and funny the way he would tell everything. But he was talking about, he said, I woke up one night and he said it was so stuffy in the bedroom there. And he said there was a fan hanging right over our bed. And he said, I thought, I'm going to turn that fan on. You know, he said, I'm going to turn the switch on. And nothing happened. He thought, oh, great, the fans turned off. So he says, I'm up here in the dark, and I'm trying to find, and he says, you know, there are two strings. Which one do I pull to turn the fan on? And so he said, I thought, okay, I'm pretty sure it's this string. And he says, so I pulled that string on, and he said, a 100-watt light bulb came on that close to my face. He said, I just fell back in bed. When you're in the dark, light is offensive to you. When you're living in sin... The light of God's truth is offensive to you. And that makes us, therefore, an enemy in our disposition towards God. But the Bible also says, not only does sin make us enemies with God, but, but the Bible also says that sin makes God an enemy to us. Jesus talked about the wrath of God abiding on someone. Some people would think, well, my God, and I hear people say it sometimes, my God is just too loving to ever do something like that. My God is just too loving to send someone to hell. Well, I would encourage you to read Matthew chapter 7. Jesus will say, Depart ye wicked into everlasting punishment. I never knew you. Revelation chapter 20 talks about what God will say to those who've never accepted him, what he will, how he will respond, how he will react to that. The Bible says God finds no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but in his holiness he is, he is angry. He is I, I was even reading this. I, w I wanted to make sure that I was right on this. And I have a, a good friend that's a seminary professor. And so I, periodically I will email him and I will say, you know, am I right on thinking this? And he sent me back a list of verses the other day that really I didn't even know some of those existed of how that God became angry with the nation of Israel. And he says, I will have to pour out my wrath on you because of your sinfulness. Sin makes us an enemy in our attitude towards God, but the Bible also says that sin is offensive to God, so it makes God an enemy to us. I, as I was studying this, I was thinking about how it affects me whenever I hear that a child has been abused. I mean, if I can step out of the pulpit here just for a second, they can do whatever they want to with somebody that abuses a child. They can't punish them enough. In my opinion. Okay, I'll get back in the pulpit here. And you know, I'm a sinful person and that offends me. How much more do you think it offends a holy God? You know how that you feel when you hear that a child has been abused and maybe even sexually abused. How it just makes you angry. You just want, you just want, you want justice to be done. We're sinful people and we want that. What do we, how do we think it affects God? The Bible says it angers God. Do you know that most of the time in the Bible when the word anger is used, it's used in reference to God? Most of the time the word anger is used, it's used in reference to God. And what it is speaking of is God's feeling towards the sin. Sin is offensive to God, to His holy nature. Yet in all of this, us having this enmity with God, the Bible says that God has done something really amazing. Look at Matthew chapter 5. Go to the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus says, we'll get into this message a little later on, but Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, he's trying to lay a foundation for what Christian character should be like, who we should be in the Bible. Jesus said in verse 43 of Matthew chapter 5, You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. 
That sounds good, doesn't it? Love the people that you can get along with and hate the rest. Verse 44, but I say unto you, love your enemies. Love your enemies. That's not an easy thing to do. Matter of fact, I would submit to you that that's something that even most Christians don't do. Because it's hard. Especially if we think that individual's in the wrong, right? I mean, especially if we feel like they've done something that is wrong, then it's a natural reaction in us to want to, to be angry towards that person. You know, it says in Ephesians chapter 4 that be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Here's an interesting thing. He says, there is a time to be angry. Yet you can't let your anger turn into sin. And he describes sinful anger as being wrath. There's a difference really in anger and wrath. If somebody would, if somebody would attack my family, if somebody would come in and, and harm my family in some way, do you think it would make me angry? I'd probably have to step out of the pulpit for a while. If somebody hurt my family, it would make me angry and rightfully so. But if I went and got one of my guns and went out and tried to kill that individual, that would be sinful. There's a difference in anger and, and wrath. And the Bible says you may be angry over something, but don't let that anger turn into bitterness and wrath and go to bed with that. Jesus said, you've heard it, what, you, what you, the common way to do is love the people, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. I send to you, love your enemies, verse 44, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Wow. Verse 45, that or so that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. And then Jesus goes on to talk about he lets it rain on the just and on the unjust. What he's saying is, is he says God loves his enemies. Now, I want to tell you something. They're still in many ways his enemies. They're still enemies. The simple people of the world in many ways are still the enemies of God. They are still in enmity in their disposition, their attitude towards God. They don't want anything to do with God. They're stiff-arming God. They're rebelling against God. And if they do not accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, one day they will have to suffer the wrath of God. The wrath of God. But yet, the heart of God is to love even his enemies. Jesus really demonstrated that, didn't he, when he was on the cross. When he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Were all of those men forgiven at that point? Did they all become Christians that day? No. They didn't become Christians until they each individually repented of their sins and turned to God. But Jesus was revealing the heart of God that day. People who were railing upon Him, people who were spitting, and people who had physically abused Him and now verbally abusing Him, Jesus is on the cross praying, Father, my desire is, my heart is, is that they can be forgiven. Jesus was demonstrating love even for His enemies. Let me read to you something out of the book of Romans. God's love for His enemies. The Bible says, for when we were still yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Who did Jesus die for? Sinners. Sinful, wicked people. That's who Jesus chose to give his life for, the ungodly. And then Paul says, this is amazing, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. I mean, would you give your life, would you go to the electric chair today for somebody that you felt was a good person? I would say probably most of us would not do it. Paul says, rarely would anybody even die for a good person. Yet perhaps for a good someone, some would even dare to die. But he said, God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And he says, much more than now having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. God did an amazing thing 2,000 years ago. God not only chose to love his enemies, but God took the suffering upon himself in order to make a way so that there could be, the, word, the biblical word is reconciliation so that his enemies could be reconciled to him. What does it mean to be reconciled? 
If you and I have a difference with each other, in order for us to be reconciled, it means to be brought, we're brought back together. To reconcile is to what's torn apart, you're able to bring it back together. This is amazing love. I hope that you're thinking about it a little bit, that God would love the people that by his nature he's angry against, yet he would love them enough that he would be willing to suffer himself to make a way so that there could be reconciliation between him and his enemies. Maybe to help illustrate that, let's, let's, let's consider for a moment how we would react to our enemies. Let's say that we don't go out after them. We won't go after our enemies, but what will we do? Turn our back to them. Cold shoulder them. Ignore them. Avoid them. Right? That's what we do with our enemies. And yet Jesus said, if you want to be considered, Jesus said, if you want to be considered as a child of your father, then you need to learn how to love even your enemies. It's hard, isn't it? It only happened by a life that is yielded to God to produce that through us. The greatest peacemaker this world has ever known is God. When Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, he was not asking anything of us that God himself has not already done. The greatest peacemaker this world has ever known is God and what he did for us. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, Jesus said this in his Beatitudes, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. The peacemakers will be called the children of God. Literally, the word peacemaker there means those who work to produce peace. A peacemaker. He's not just saying blessed are the peace, people that are at peace. He's not just saying blessed are those who are peaceable by nature. He's saying blessed are those who will reach out and do something in order to try to establish peace where there isn't peace. T. Robertson, who was a great Greek scholar, wrote this about this. He said, it is hard enough to keep peace. It is still even more difficult to bring peace where there is no peace. That takes a lot of effort. The natural thing to do is when there is no peace is to avoid it. To just step back from it. Let it go. Forget you, man. <laughs> right? Forget you. I can live without you. You ever said that to yourself? I have. Forget you. That's the attitude. That's the natural attitude. And Jesus said the natural attitude is to love your, enemy, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I'm saying to you that if you're going to be a child of God, if you're going to be a, one of my followers, then you've got to go wrong beyond just loving your neighbor. You've got to get to the point to where you, like God, will love your enemies. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who will get out of their comfort zone in order to try to do something to reestablish the peace where there now is no peace. That's what Jesus is saying here. When you think about a peacemaker, you have to take a few moments and consider the exact, what is the exact opposite of a peacemaker? A troublemaker. Do you know that the Bible speaks about troublemakers? The Bible has much to say about troublemakers. Let me read to you something out of the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 6 says, these six things doth the Lord hate. What does God hate? Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. The word abomination means it's detestable. It makes God sick. He hates it. What, are, what does God get so angry about? A proud look. A lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. Or maybe we could put in that a tongue that sheds innocent blood. And heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Feet that be swift to run into mischief. A false witness that spreadeth lies. And he that soweth discord among the brethren. The Bible says God hates it when people are troublemakers. God detests it when people stir up strife when there is no need for there to be strife. God detests it because it's the exact opposite of his nature. His nature is to be peaceful, to be loving, to try to reconcile. 
If the whole world right now, if the whole world at this very moment would submit to the will of God, what would happen? If every person in this world this day submitted entirely to the will of God, what would happen? Everybody would accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. And as Roger, I'll get it out of a minute, peace on earth. There would be peace between God and man, and there would be peace with everyone else. And that's what will happen one day. During the millennial kingdom of Christ, when Jesus put binds Satan and he's bound for a thousand years, when he subdues peace, the Bible says it will reach a point to where even the animal kingdom that are enemies, a wolf and a lion, or a wolf and a lamb, will lie down together. And a little child will be out there leading them. That's what God wants. And so do you see, do you understand, when there's not peace, why is there not peace? Sin. Rebellion against the will of God. Rebellion on an individual basis. Rebellion in nations. Rebellion in churches. Rebellion in whoever it might be. Turn with me, if you will, to James chapter 3. James, boy, James really lays it out for us, doesn't it? And you study through the book of James. And James has something to say about people who stir up strife, people, troublemakers. And actually, what's the instigation or instigator of all of this, where all this trouble comes from? James chapter 3. James is talking about the tongue. And he starts out the chapter. We won't read the entire chapter. But he starts out the chapter about those who are teachers. Now, when he talks about being a teacher, he's talking about someone who maybe is myself or a Sunday school teacher. But I really think that if you put teacher in its context, what he's saying is, it's a warning to those who are quick to share their opinion with everyone else. It's a warning to those who think that they know it all, and so they're going to tell everyone else the way it ought to be. And he talks about the tongue, and then drop down to verse 8. But he says, the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. And then he says in verse 9, with this tongue, and he's writing to Christians, therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men which are made after the similitude of God. And cursing there doesn't necessarily mean using a four-letter word. Cursing there means, means speaking evil about them and against them. That's what the word cursing there means. James is saying the tongue is very hypocritical because the tongue at one moment, is this convicting you? It is me. The tongue is very hypocritical because one minute the tongue is worshiping God and the next minute the tongue is cursing Speaking against someone, he says, who's made, been made in the likeness of God. Verse 10, out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. He says, think about it for a moment. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear all it berries, either a vine, figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. What he's saying is, he says, when we pretend that we're blessing God and turn around and cursing others, we're just hypocrites. Our worship is hypocrisy is what he's saying. And then he says in verse 13, Who then is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? You want to be a teacher? You want to tell everyone else you've got something to comment on everything? All right, so who is this wise person that's been endued with knowledge? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. In other words, let him or her prove that they have the knowledge of God by the way they live and by the way they treat others. Verse 14, But if you have bitter envy, you're jealous. Why do we cut other people down? Because we're jealous of them. We, we think if we can put them down, it will make us look better. Those are the people that we cut down. And he says, but if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth, this wisdom descendeth not from above, but it is earthly, it is sensual, it is even devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. So James is saying about this in regards to being a troublemaker. He says, if you pretend that you know it all and you pretend that you've got wisdom and you're the one that has to tell everybody how everything, why do we judge other people? Why are we so critical of other people? It's pride. Because we think we're better than they are. 
we think that we've arrived, and so therefore that puts us in the position to, to condemn them. Judging other people is, is a, it's a revelation that we're proud in our own spirit as opposed to being poor and humble before God. And James says, what James is saying is, he says, the quickest way that's going to be revealed what's in your heart is what comes out your mouth. The quickest way what will be revealed what is in your heart is what comes out your mouth. And he says, if what is coming out of your mouth is causing division and strife, and if it's speaking against people and if it's slander, he says, then listen, don't, don't fool yourself. Your wisdom is not from above. Your wisdom is from the devil. That's what he says. It's devilish. It's, it's brutish. That's what sensual means. It's like brute beast. That's the kind of wisdom that he says that you have. But in contrast to that, being a peacemaker, verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure. Then it's what? Peaceable. It's gentle. It's easy to be entreated. In other words, it means it's compliant with other people. It's full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. He says the wisdom that is from above isn't one, at one moment blessing God and cursing people. It doesn't have hypocrisy. He says the wisdom that is from above is not attacking other people. It's pure. He says the wisdom that is from above doesn't cause division. It's compliant with other people. He says the wisdom that is from above is gentle. It seeks to establish peace. And verse 18, look what he says in verse 18. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by them that make peace. One translation says this, Peacemakers who sow in peace will raise a harvest of righteousness. He says peacemakers will produce righteousness. You have heard that it hath been said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemies. I say love your enemies. Why, why would Jesus say love your enemies? Why would Jesus say, seek to establish peace with your enemies? Why would Jesus pray on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do? Because God is the God of peace. There was peace in heaven before Satan rebelled against God. There was peace on earth until Adam and Eve rebelled against God. There was peace in the home. One day there will be peace again. Heaven will be a place of peace, right? Well, the last thing it says in the book of Revelation, it talks about a war in heaven. And it says Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. That's when Satan is going to be finally kicked out. No longer any access to God at that point. And from that point on, then there will be able, God will be able to once again reestablish peace in heaven. There will be anxiety and conflict in heaven, right? Do you expect to have conflict in heaven? I don't know. I expect heaven to be a perfect place of, of love, of a love, a total submission to God. I believe heaven to be a perfect place of where we love each other, we care for each other. There won't be pride in heaven. There won't be arrogance. There won't be slander. There won't be criticism. There won't be forget you in heaven. Heaven will be a place of peace and love. And I think that one of the things that Jesus is trying to teach on the Sermon on the Mount is, is that the reason we are here right now is because God is trying to reestablish that peace, that relationship with individuals one-on-one. -on -one. He's trying to do that. Pam and I have been married for 32 years. The first several years of our marriage, there was not peace in our home. Before I went into the ministry, I worked, I was a draftsman. We went to church Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. We were there every time. If it had been some moment, if it had been a week long revival, we would have been there every night. We went to church and everybody looked at us from the outside and thought, oh, what a sweet little couple. But we would get back home and we were, there was a power struggle and we were fighting and we were arguing and we were even talking about getting a divorce. We had a baby, that didn't solve the problem. We bought a house. That didn't solve the problem. We even drove a Honda. That didn't solve the problem. Why? We didn't have peace between each other because we did not have peace with God. Individually. 
We did not have peace in our home because we had both. We really, even though we professed to be Christians, we in our, in our attitude and in our actions and in what we wanted, what we wanted. That's why we had such power struggle, fighting with each other. And when both of us then began to submit our lives individually to God, you know what started coming into our home? Peace. I, I, I've been married 32 years. I love my wife more now than I even in the beginning. I, seriously. You know, I, we kind of like the rest of us, you know, we're moving along in life and you get a little bit older. But I think this is the greatest thing, really, that God could do for me here on earth. Is to give me somebody to, to, hey, to put it this way, but get old with. We're not there yet, honey, but, you know, I'm, I'm thankful for that. Why? Because I have peace in my relationship with God, therefore I have peace in my relationship with my wife. I love, you know what, you know what one of the best times of the entire week for me? Between now and 12 o'clock. I love Sunday morning at Twin Oaks. You know why? Because I love you. I mean, I love Pastor Zach, and he and I have a good relationship, but, you know, isn't it good, you know? It's good, man, it is good when God's people come. You know, we do everything all week long, trying to just get it ready, everything, as best we can, just because to welcome and say, yes, we are glad you're here. Why? I have peace with God, and I have peace with you. I think God often, I know it sounds really crazy, but I think God often that we're going to spend eternity together. Really. I mean, we're going to know each other forever and forever and forever and forever. And one of these days we'll be past this old earth and past ourselves. And boy, just dancing with joy before the throne of God. The reason I have that is because God has brought peace into my life. And God has made me an ambassador of peace. You know, what, you know what witnessing to people is about? Why do we go out and witness to people? We say, well, we witness to people because we don't want them to go to hell. Well, that's true. Do you know God's angle from that? We witness to them because God says, will you help me reestablish peace with them? I made them. I love them. Will you talk? I, I talked with a young man the other evening, he'll be baptized here tonight. And he, he knew a lot, and he said he had prayed some, but I shared the gospel with him. And we went through the gospel again, and I said, would you like to pray with me and to make sure that you know Jesus Christ is your Savior? And he said, yes, and I prayed with him. And i tell you what I was thinking about as I was praying with him. What a blessing. I helped this young man establish peace with God. He's a child of God. I led him... To back to being reconciled with God. Instead of rather having to one day suffer the wrath of God, I helped him to be reestablished in peace with his maker. That's what it means to be a peacemaker. You go out into the world, you want to make peace. You want to make peace in the home. You want to make peace in the workplace. You want to make peace. And you say, does that mean establishing peace at the sake of truth? No. But the Bible says this, even when you speak the truth, you're to speak it how? In love. It's simple to speak the truth in anger. It's simple really to speak the truth out of just trying to, to, to put somebody in their place. That's not God. The wrath of man works not the righteousness of God, the Bible says. That's sin to do that. Jesus even said the purpose, and we'll study it more later at another time. He said even the purpose when you go and you try to reconcile a relationship. He says when you go to somebody, when you go and you have to actually talk with somebody that you're at odds with, Jesus said you're to go there with the attitude of trying to reconcile the relationship. Not go to put them in their place and scold them, but to actually try to reconcile the relationship. Do you know that even church discipline, if you will study what the purpose, even church discipline is for the purpose of us bringing peace. The purpose for church discipline was to help that believer understand, I have sinned against God. The whole church recognizes that I've sinned against God. How in the world do I ever get to this point? Oh, God, forgive me. Can I come back? Yes! First Corinthians, Paul says you need to do some church discipline on a young man that's living in immorality. He says you need to do church discipline. The man repented of it. You know what Paul said in Second Corinthians? Receive him back! 
prodigal son's home. Peace is here again. That's what life is about. How do we become peacemakers? Let me share with you three things and I close. Number one, we must desire peace. We must desire peace. Do you desire peace? Do you desire peace? Do you desire peace with other people? Do you desire peace in your home? Do you desire peace in the church? Do you desire peace between man and God? Paul said in the book of Colossians, let the peace of God rule in your heart. The word rule means to umpire. He says, rather than letting your emotions umpire you, rather than letting your emotions control you, he said, let the peace of God control you. You have to desire peace. Secondly, I believe you have to possess peace. Jesus is going to talk about it at a later time that often when we're at conflict with other people. Not only are we at conflict with other people, he says we're at conflict with God. Jesus said when there's conflict with other people, oftentimes, along with that, at least one of the individuals, maybe both, is that conflict with God. And so you have to desire, you have to really want peace, you have to know that you possess peace in your own heart. Let me read to you something Peter said. For the one who wants to love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it because the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open to their request. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. You want God to bless you with a good life? You want a happy life? The Bible says you have to seek peace. The Bible says you have to seek be a peacemaker. The writer of Hebrews says, Without peace and holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Thirdly, we have to strive for peace. It's not just enough to want peace. Oftentimes, we've got to do something to make peace. That's what it means to be a peacemaker. You make peace. You don't just wish for peace. You do something to help make peace. Paul said in Romans 14, let us therefore follow after these things which make for peace. The writer of he or Ephesians, Paul says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. To be a peacemaker means oftentimes we've got to go out of our comfort zone. We've got to do the uncomfortable thing to have the conversation in order to try to, to, to establish peace, whether it's between us and someone else or between two other individuals between someone else and God. Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. As I was studying this the other day, a song came to my mind, Love Lifted Me. I'm going to ask Tracy to come, if she would, please. And I'd like for us to sing this song this morning. If you would like to, to come and pray, you're certainly welcome to come and pray this morning. But as I thought about this message, I thought, you know, sometimes some messages maybe you respond to they come in front at the altar. Oftentimes, though, the message, especially the kind of messages that I preach, oftentimes the responses that you make in your own heart. The invitation many times is not what you do at the end of the church, it's what we do tomorrow and the rest of the week, how we apply what we've heard. And so I thought about this song, and I thought about what a great, great, joyful, it's a happy, joyful song for us to sing about God's love for us. And so as we sing, let's just stand to our feet, if you feel like you need to come and pray, please come and pray. But as you sing this morning this song, think about God's love for you, what it's done for you. And then think about how that maybe God wants to use you to establish peace where there is no peace.